Hello, and welcome to my capstone presentation. I'm Alex Romanowski, and today I will be talking about development of net zero multifamily homes in the Northeast. I'd like to thank David Bruins from the Bruins Realty Group for sponsoring this project. I'll begin by touching on climate change and the inspiration behind this project, going into a short introduction, and then the financial analysis of Solara, which is the net zero multifamily apartment complex that we'll be looking at today. I'll then go into a technical review and finish off with some concluding thoughts. Before we get into that, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit more. I go to Lehigh University and I'm in their Masters of Energy Systems Engineering program. I graduated from Lehigh with a Bachelor's of Science in Integrated Business and Engineering in Finance and got a minor in Mechanics Materials. I'm currently working for and have spent the past year and a half at Active Solar Development, LLC. We do commercial solar development in upstate New York, and I'm on their land team. I also spent a summer in New Jersey on DR Horton's land team as an intern. Climate change and the reason why. Hopefully by now, you all are familiar with the impacts of climate change as a result of our actions and what we're doing to the world. If you're not familiar, here's the East Coast of America at 1.5 degrees C of global warming. This is the projected sea level rise at 10 feet. You can see the future sea level in that medium blue there and the existing sea level at the light and darker blue. This is personally important to me because my current home is underwater and my favorite place on earth, Florida Keys, is also underwater. We're gonna see a ton of people displaced as a lot of our coastline gets flooded. Why do I care? Well, I grew up in Florida, hunting, fishing, snorkeling, scuba diving. If it was outdoors, you name it, I did it. I wanna be able to give my kids same world that my parents were able to give me. Unfortunately, our world's changing a lot. And it looks like if we keep traveling down this path, my kids and their grand and their kids aren't going to be able to get to see the Florida Keys. They're only going to be able to hear about it in stories. I don't want to have to explain to them how my actions today led to the consequences that they're going to see in their lifetime. We're running out of time. The IPCC estimates that by 2026, if we follow our current trends, we will exceed 1.5 degrees C and the keys will be gone. Furthermore, if we stay on track with our current carbon usage, by 2037, we will blow past two degrees C of global warming. On the left-hand side, you can see this chart. This was from a UN emissions gap report in 2022. And that blue line shows the annual carbon reduction we will need in order to stay below two degrees Celsius by 2050. The UN gives us a 66% chance that we will actually stay below two degrees Celsius. And that requires a lot of change. Above those lines, above that line, you can see current policy, unconditional pledges and conditional pledges. Right now, we are not on a track to be able to stay below that. So what happens if we miss? I'd highly encourage you to check out the source bottom right hand side of the screen. Um, most of my sources are linked that way if they're not already cited in the description. This is a excellent article that talks on all sorts of climate modeling. and Basically, we're probably underestimating how fast our climate's actually warming. Now to the chart. On the y-axis, you can see the damages of natural disasters as a percent of GDP. And on the x, you get global warming in temperature. You can see there's a clear relationship between as global temperatures get hotter, we're going to see more damages as a function of GDP. And this is based off of natural disasters and the damages that they cause. And then they've got several different logarithmic predictions trying to fit that curve and estimate what we're going to see 
as economic impacts going forward. But regardless, temperature rises, the weather is going to become less and less stable. We're going to see more droughts, more flooding, more wildfires, stronger hurricanes, things like that. And a lot of people are going to suffer. So what can we do? Well, buildings currently make up for 27% of annual CO2 emissions. And this is according to the IEA. The construction industry as a whole makes up for an additional 13% of that. So if we reduce our operating emissions and our embodied carbon going into our construction, then we'll reduce annual global CO2 emissions and hopefully stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. How do we do that? Well, we have to build net zero. Net zero is when energy consumption is equal to energy production. For this project, I would like to understand the financial and technical challenges of net zero building and promote viable solutions within the development community. All this said, there has been a large increase in green building, especially between 2008 to 2020. We've seen a lot of zero energy verified and emerging projects coming online. Unfortunately, if you look at that total of 700, that's nothing in comparison to the United States building stock. We need to be doing more. We're running out of time. Now that you understand my motivation behind this project, I'd like to go in a little bit more of an introduction. How did I get here? Two summers ago, I ended up in Schenectady, New York, looking for a job. I went online and typed in net zero building as I was already interested in the topic and found Net Zero Village and Solara. Cold called, reach out. A couple of weeks later, I was up on the roof installing a solar thermal pool system with another Lehigh alumni. It's a great experience. I got to tour the projects and get a better understanding of how all this technology comes together. I thought it was super neat. That's why I'm sharing this with you today. What are their successful projects? Well, there's Net Zero Village on the left. This finished construction in 2016, and it was the Bruins Realty Group goal to deliver a market rate, multifamily, net zero project. Solara on the right just finished construction this year and went a step above Net Zero Village. They were a luxury apartment, and they built phase three to be low embodied carbon and have more carbon sequestration. It's not only important that we lower carbon over the lifetime of the building, but we need to stop emitting carbon today. So low embodied carbon using several different techniques reduces the amount of CO2 that goes into building a project. These projects are located in Rotterdam. And they've got a third one on the, on the way. This is EcoFlats. EcoFlats is going to be FIAS Zero certified. That means that it is will be certified as passive house and built to net zero standards. They keep challenging themselves as these projects are coming up. When I asked Dave what his inspiration was for these projects, he said it came down to three different things. First of which was interest. These projects are technically challenging and they have a lot of different elements. He honestly just found it really interesting. Second of which was project differentiation. If the market tanks, these are beautiful, clean, green projects, and there are hardly any of them like it in America. He thinks that they'll be more resistant to shocks in the market. And the third is it's an ethical choice. It's the right thing to do. We all love our world. Let's make it better. I had three main questions pretty much as soon as I stepped on site for the first time. I'll be talking in this presentation about the first question, and next semester, I'll be exploring the next two questions and presenting about those in May. First of which, how are these projects all market rate, net zero buildings, yet still financially viable? Second, if these ones work, why isn't this done everywhere? And if it doesn't work everywhere, where does it? Now we're going to look into Solara. This project has 11 buildings, 248 units, three stories with elevators. As I mentioned, it's a luxury apartment complex. So they've got all sorts of amenities like covered parking, 
a clubhouse, solar heated pool, covered patio with outdoor fireplace, and a ton more. As you can see from the insides of the units, they've got some nice finishes. Quartz countertops, hardwood floors, nice hardware and cabinetry, whisper quiet fans, and the units come in three different configurations. They range from $1,750 a month to $2,400. By the way, those include utilities, dish TV, Wi-Fi, covered parking, and a couple other amenities. If you're like me, first question is, how are they making money on this? Well, on the left-hand side of your graph, you'll see that a traditional apartment owner charges their base rent, and then the tenant pays the utility bill separately. At Solara, the rental is all in. So you have owner paid utilities, which are significantly reduced because the buildings are built for such high efficiency and they have on-site power generation like the solar panels. And then by charging the market rate for those utilities, we see an increased operating income and that goes towards covering the additional capital expenditures that made the project green. Now that we understand the basic financial model, let's dig a little bit deeper into these numbers. Before we do that, I'd like to shout out NYSERDA and the Building of Excellence Award. NYSERDA is a state-run organization, and the Building of Excellence Award goes to builders that are working on carbon-neutral projects. They've got $100,000 for early design and a $1 million for once you finish construction. Net Zero Village, Solara, and EcoFlats are all recipients of these awards. What the BOE has done is consolidated a lot of cost data to encourage development in the net zero space from other people interested in the projects. Again, uh, links in the bottom right hand corner, got a really great webinar and some slides on this. But looking on the left hand side of the graph, we see low rise cost data from the Building of Excellence compared to national averages taken from the Dodge construction database. What we can see from pre-COVID, COVID and post-COVID is that the BOE buildings have stayed for the most part in market and in line with competitive costs. Now, digging into the financial aspects of Solara, here's a cost breakdown debt and equity stack. Feel free to pause the video at any point during these numbers. Um, I'm just gonna be highlighting a few of these. So looking at the total cost, there was $48.3 million of this project. If we look at the phase one costs, there were four buildings for a total cost less the land of $16 million, which came out to $130 per square foot. And this includes the solar array. Phase three was three buildings and $140 per square foot. Phase one and phase three have the differentiation in cost due to COVID price hikes. And also phase three was built for low embodied carbon and carbon sequestration. Phase two includes the clubhouse. So we're not gonna look at those numbers. Um, just trying to give you a better sense of what it actually costs for the apartment units themselves. Now, looking at the project as a whole, with the net operating income after debt service for principal and interest, we're at 1.1 million. Assuming a cap rate of 5.5%, is taking a market average um, given interest rates right now, it'll give us a disposition value of $63.4 million. This project is going to see cash back within 3.28 years. This is starting after construction and going forward with the building fully leased up. Uh, the lease up periods for this only took a month or two before they were fully occupied. So they went quick. They did see a lot of incentives on this project and cash back without incentives was seven years. Now looking at the return on green investment. This is something that I was particularly interested in because there aren't that many of these projects. So how do they make this one work? Well, the cost per unit was $180,000. And in 2019, the Bruins Realty Group estimated that the green features cost an additional 18%. So that comes out to $32,400,000. Now, 
they're capturing $200 a month from the utility fee that they're charging tenants. This comes out to $1,850 a year after uh, subtracting the annual utility bill. And for this, we're not including water and sewer. This is because most apartment complexes already include water and sewer in their rent. Now, evaluating this at a cap rate of 5.5%, we get 33.7 million. But the deal gets better because there are incentives. They saw around $20,000 in incentives per unit, giving total additional value of $21,000 per unit and a total additional value of 1.5 million to the project. And keep in mind, this is just for phase three. And again, the reason why we're looking at phase three specifically is because it was built for low embodied carbon and carbon sequestration. The Bruins Realty Group did a study using Rent Cafe to find the average cost of utilities and some other amenities in New York State because they wanted to price out what they're charging in their utility fee versus the market. Adding up all of these things, they found the market value to be estimated at $582. That is well above their $200 fee. Now, I like to specifically look at these four things. Electricity, heater hot water, internet, and basic cable, because most apartment owners are going to at least buy these. Maybe they'll skip out on some of the covered parking or some other things. Now, keep that number in your head. We'll get back to it. Looking at where Solara is in the market, I did a competitive market analysis of luxury apartments in Rotterdam and Schenectady. There's not a huge luxury building stock in these areas. So I tried to pull apartments that had elevators, nicer finishes, and common amenities. As you can see, Solara is towards the top of the market and Net Zero Village is definitely towards you know, middle of the pack, but that's expected because it's uh, not luxury and walk up. What's important to remember is that both Solara and Net Zero Village have utilities bundled in with their rent. So what happens if we look at the price that tenants are actually paying for the rent? Well, adding that $372 per month figure to all of the rents, we see that Solara is significantly under market. If we bump their utility fee from $200 to $372, that's where we get the adjusted Solara price in those hollowed out diamonds there. And we can see that by increasing their fee from 200 to 372, Solara is still going to be within market. The reason why they haven't done this is because the rent is fully bundled. The Bruins Realty Group is concerned that the tenants will get sticker shock if the rent goes too much higher because they're already towards the top of their market. Now, what other developers have been doing is taking the rental price and then having a utility fee separated so you get away from that sticker shock. Assuming they do that, let's see what this does to the financials. Adjusting that monthly utility fee to $372 this gives a disposition value of that fee, $71,000. This creates a total additional value per unit at $38,800 and total additional value to phase three of $2.8 million. So $2.8 million to phase three without incentives. What is the effect on valuation and cash back? Well, we can see that the NOI after debt service for principal and interest has now increased to 1.6 million and adjusting that at a 5.5% cap rate, we now have a market value of $72.7 million, which is an increase in $9.3 million for the way that Solara is currently structured. This is a 14.7% increase in value just by right sizing the utility fee to the market. How does this impact cash back? Assuming no incentives, we're looking at 4.77 years of cash back, which is an increase of 1.5 years. That said, 
$9.3 million of increased value, not bad. And most importantly, this project works without incentives in New York State. That's pretty incredible to me. Now, looking more at question one and going into some of the technical aspects of Solaro. When the Bruins Realty Group first started this project, they wanted three things, affordability, scalability, and to make it easy for trades to build. These are not craftsman building these projects. It, they're just your everyday trades. So the framing has to be simple enough. Everything needs to be simple to where these projects are actually buildable. Additionally, they brought in developer, architect, engineers, GC, and energy modeling expert all into early on design meetings. This is common for green building, but this team took it to a whole nother level. The architect and the energy modeling expert were responsible for design and also ensuring that they're meeting their climate goals. The contractor, on the other hand, and the developer helped to control costs and speak on the behalf of the trades. If the design was getting too complicated, GC could interject and wheel it back, see where they could simplify things, really hash things out and cut costs. Additionally, by the engineers sitting in on these meetings, they could understand that they could right size the equipment instead of oversizing equipment. This helped reduce cost and also increase energy efficiency. Again, I'd encourage you to pause on these next few slides if you want to read through them. I'm just going to be touching on a few things. First of which, double pane argon windows. A lot of people think that you need triple pane for net zero building, but the dollar per energy saved is simply not worth it. Additionally, these are all oriented south for solar gain during the winter, and they have sunshades to keep out some of that solar heat during the summer. For the insides of the apartments, you've got LED lighting, low flow water fixtures, heat pump water dryer, all Energy Star appliances, and a building management system. We'll get into all of that later. Now, there's a couple of main pillars behind green building. First of which is to make the buildings airtight and then you want to reduce heat loss by reducing heat loss and getting energy efficiency appliances and right sizing all the load, you're going to reduce your energy needs and that's going to save on your solar costs. One way you do this is by eliminating thermal bridging. Thermal bridging is a weak point in the insulation. This allows for heat transfer between conditioned and unconditioned spaces, which reduces building efficiency. First place that they did this was in the slab. They started off with a vapor barrier directly under the slab. And this was 10 millimeters thick, which is significantly thicker than traditional vapor barriers. And what this is going to do is present, prevent moisture transfer from the ground to creeping up against the slab. Then they have six inches of gravel, which create a nice flat base for the slab to sit on. That also drains well. And then you have two inches of rigid insulation. This is going to prevent heat transfer between the ground and the building. Making this low carbon, they mixed in 30% of fly ash, which is a coal byproduct, into the slab. Concrete is heavily CO2 intensive, so by mixing in fly ash, they're reducing the amount of concrete they actually poured. They also just reduced the amount of concrete that they actually poured by reducing the foundation. They re-ran the calculations and realized they didn't need as thick of a foundation as they poured in phase one and phase two. The building envelope. I know this is a little bit hard to read, so just bear with me. Uh, the roof is oriented there. We're looking at wall sections of drawings from phase one and phase two. And the building envelope changed between phase one and phase two because they needed to make building have low embodied carbon. So in phase one, the building envelope goes from the slab all the way to the roof. And by building envelope, I mean the air sealed envelope of the building. So with these projects, they essentially wanted to make a taped box that was airtight. This prevents a lot of heat loss. In phase three, 
they had to lower that envelope from the slab up to the third floor ceiling. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But those main difference between phase one and phase three is they dropped it from the roof down to the third floor ceiling. Now, how'd they create this airtight box? They used zip wall sheathing and zip tape and zipped it all together. When they dropped that envelope to the third floor ceiling, they had to put the zip up prior to the installation of the load bearing walls. This creates continuous air barrier around the building. Then they smoke and blower door tested the whole thing a couple different times. The GCs were primarily responsible for air sealing, all the mechanical penetrations of the exterior building that the trades had missed. By doing this sealing in-house, they saved a considerable amount of money, but it did take a lot of time. Then they had an insulation specialist spend one day per apartment sealing all the mechanical penetrations between apartments. So that way your apartments are completely compartmentalized. So I can have my temperature settings on, you know, different than yours and our air is not going to mix causing inefficiencies. Going forward, they're thinking about moving to aero barrier. Aero barrier is commonly used within ducting to seal uh, penetrations to the air ducts, but it's being used more and more within buildings that are trying to leave, uh, achieve really low air exchange rates. Essentially, you pressurize the building and release this aerosol and it sticks together and seals up around small you know, penetrations in the envelope. How they do the insulation? Well, for phase three, they took two by 10 exterior framing and dense packed cellulose. Cellulose is made from paper products and is typically 82 to 85% recycled. Because it's from paper products, it sequesters a lot of carbon, and those paper products are no longer decomposing in a landfill where that carbon will eventually, once the products decompose, go back into our atmosphere. Now, this carbon is stored for as long as the building is lasting. Looking a little bit deeper into the insulation, we can see we've got zip sheathing and then vented vinyl siding on the exterior, and on the interior, there's a drywall with a class two vapor retarder primer over it. Now, if you're really into building science, you might be wondering, where's the true vapor barrier on these walls? There isn't one. They want the walls to breathe. Here's why. So the dew point is caused within the walls when you have unconditioned space and conditioned space meeting. So in the winter time, you've got this hot air on the inside and cold air on the outside. This can cause condensation where, these, where the hot air meets the cold air and condenses the moisture in the air. This can be a problem in walls and you usually don't want this. However, cellulose is really resistive to this, does a great job of dispersing all of the moisture, and it's not like it concentrates anywhere. The stuff is super dense packed. It's basically like you know, a piece of wood with inside your walls. That's how dense this stuff gets. And it does a really good job of slowly spreading out the moisture and then the walls can breathe. So in the winter, the interior is going to be the humid side as the exterior is incredibly dry. So that humid air is going to slowly, through osmosis, work its way into the wall. And then the dry side will dry it out as it leaches through the wall, back out, into the open. Now, again, it's not like a constant flow of moisture. This is just a very slow process that happens. It's not like the walls are soaked on the inside, but they can breathe, which is what you want. Now, in the summertime, it's the opposite. You've got the hot, humid side on the exterior of the wall and the dry, cool side on the interior. So you've got drying from one side during the winter and drying from another side during the summer. Let's look a little bit more at the framing. They framed these buildings to reduce the thermal bridges that I mentioned earlier. How do you do this? Well, when an interior wall meets an exterior wall, typically you have a stud there and those wooden studs wouldn't have insulation behind them. So that creates a thermal bridge. If you wanna reduce that, you have these ladders 
where the interior wall meets it. So by cross bracing this framing, you can put blown insulation behind that wall intersection. And this is going to eliminate the thermal bridge. Remember, better air tightness and better insulation leads to lower heating and cooling needs because the building is better insulated. Lower in heating and cooling needs means less electricity production, which means cheaper electric bill and less solar needed to offset the electricity. Let's go into the roof a little bit more. So this is in phase one before they did low embodied carbon. So they have seven inches of polyiso board as their insulation. Unfortunately, polyiso board has a fair bit of embodied carbon. They also used 5 eighths zip interior roof sheathing and this created that airtight seal. Now for the phase three roof. What they did was they took 18 inches of loose fill cellulose insulation and put that right above the air barrier. Then they vented the attic to allow airflow within the attic so that there was no condensation and that the building could breathe above the building envelope. The building envelope is on that third floor ceiling through the zip wall and this keeps air on the inside of the building. Now, venting a flat roof building and creating an attic is kind of counterintuitive. They did it because they had to. Dave says that he would never do it again. And that's why you see with eco flats, they've got that A-framed roof. It's just much cheaper, simpler, and easier. But they are, had already built phase one and phase two, wanted to go low in body carbon. So they just made it happen. The domestic hot water system. This looks a little complicated, but let's walk through it. So you start off with the solar collectors. So these aren't photovoltaic. They've actually got water running through them. So as the water runs through the solar collectors, the sun heats it up. It then travels down into a thermal storage tank. This thermal storage tank is basically, you know, you call it thermal battery. I like to call it a big hot tub. So the water comes down and heats up this hot tub through a heat exchanger and then goes back up to the solar collectors and around and around and around until the water gets hot. You then have cold city water going into the hot tub, running through a heat exchanger, and it heats up to the temperature of the hot tub. In the summertime, this can get to 120 degrees and it's ready to be pumped out to the domestic hot water supply. In the shoulder seasons, it needs a little boost. So they use a air to water electric heat pump that has a coefficient of performance between two and 2.5. So this means that every kilowatt of energy that you put in, you get two to 2.5 kilowatts worth of heating. This is important because that's, you know, two to 2.5 times how efficient electric water heaters heat. Unfortunately, they don't work so well in the winter when the outside temperatures are really cold. So that's why you have an electric water heater, standard resistance water heater, to back things up, and then it shoots out and gets distributed to the apartments. This is a picture of the storage tank with the heat exchanger. You've got the air to water heat pump and the electric resistance heater here. Let's look at the domestic hot water distribution system. I know this kind of looks like a bunch of spaghetti. Let's walk through it. One inch trunk line on a recirculating loop. This is the main line that feeds most of the building. Traditionally in buildings of this size, you'd see two to three inches for a trunk line. They did the calculations and realized that they didn't actually need all of that piping and water going through the building. This means less water loss, and saving money on piping. We'll get into that a little bit later. Now, water comes off this pump pipeline and goes to the manifold, and then the manifold distributes all of these 3 8 home run twigs. These twigs run directly to each water appliance, and because of this, they're so skinny that there's so little water actually sitting in that pipe that as soon as you turn it on, your hot water from you know, coming off the trunk line, time it takes to get to your tap is shorter. 
and there's less water sitting in the line. So you're wasting less water, which means you need to heat less water and you're getting less water usage while you're waiting for that hot water to come out. On to compact plumbing. So what they did for Solara was they right sized the pipes based on measured peak flow rate data. This is the basis behind compact plumbing. And honestly, a lot of the other right sizing that they did for HVAC, everything like that. You look at what you actually need for the building and shrink your factor of safety tolerance. That's important in cost control and energy efficiency. What is compact plumbing? Well, in the red line here, we can see the Hunter Curve. The Hunter Curve was created in 1940, and believe it or not, we still use a lot of those standards for plumbing today when we're sizing our pipes. Keep in mind, the Hunter Curve was actually created based on experiments done in the, in the 1880s for galvanized steel pipe. We don't use galvanized steel pipe anymore, and that's why you get a factor of safety between measured flow rate data and the Hunter Curve of around 12. Now, smart building science folks have worked to actually measure out this data and create a water demand calculator. That's what you see in the blue dots. And the water demand calculator has a factor of safety between two and four. There's actually um, a link in the right hand side, super interesting, talks about all the things that I'm gonna be talking about now, plus more. But with compact plumbing, we can shrink that factor of safety to around two or less. The factor of safety around two is good enough for a bridge. It should be good enough for our plumbing and whether or not we know that we're gonna get hot water all the time when everybody's taking showers, right? So what happens when you exercise compact plumbing as a function of cost? Well, on the left-hand side, they sized a 92 unit multifamily building in Seattle using the Hunter Curve. And on the right hand side, they used the water demand calculator. What you can see here is that the water demand calculator does not require anything above one inch in pipe diameter. This saves a ton of money because smaller pipes cost less money. Let's take a look at the additional savings. Well, you right size the piping, you save some money, you get to right size the rest of the plumbing based on your smaller piping. So insulation and hangers, things like that, all get to be smaller because you have smaller pipes. Now you got smaller pipes, there's less water circulating throughout the building and less heat loss. So you can right size the water heater and then you can right size the water meter. And that's gonna vary a lot, but your projected first cost savings for the 92 unit apartment building case study that they did was $600 to $1,200. And then your annual operating savings were between $1,800 to $3,600. That's a lot just for right sizing your pipes. Now let's get back to some of Solaris specs. They've got an energy recovery ventilation system. When the envelope is as tight as Solaris, you're not going to have outside air exchange because the building's not breathing. This means that you need to bring in fresh and filtered air through an energy recovery ventilation system. This is controlled by the building management system and it works by bringing in unconditioned air and then conditioned stale air is going to travel through and they don't mix, but they do exchange heat and moisture. And that means that your fresh and filtered air is going to be coming into the apartment closer to the temperature of your conditioned air, so you don't have to spend as much energy cooling that down. Speaking of space heating and cooling things down, they were able to size the one unit apartments with a three quarter ton unit and the two unit apartments with a one ton ductless mini split. That may seem tiny, but because the buildings are so airtight and so well insulated, it doesn't take all that much to heat and cool the space and they put this single head mini split in the living room. You might be wondering, how does that get into the bedrooms? Well, you've got the mini split there, and then you've got this ducted, this duct that runs from mini split over into the bedrooms 
and a fan pulls that cool or hot air up and then goes into the bedrooms. There's also a backup electric baseboard heater in the bedrooms for when the winter time, because we're in climate zone five, super cold climate is definitely more heating than cooling intensive. On to the solar system. Buildings required 174 kilowatt hours per year for a 24 unit building. And this produced more than 100% of the consumption in year one. And this also includes all the EVs that were charged at this project. Let's wrap things up with the building management system. Dave actually custom built his own building management system, which is super cool. I'll run through some of the basics. So he spot measures and regulates the humidity and the volatile organic compounds. This is gonna make sure that the inside humidity of the apartment stays nice and comfortable and it's actually changed automatically based on some of the tenant habits. Additionally, the building management system acts like a traditional thermostat by communicating with the mini split and the electric baseboard heater, but it does it in the most energy efficient way from a couple of settings, which is awesome. Finally, you get to see your electricity usage compared to the other tenants. So you can see how you're doing on conserving energy and energy efficiency wise. And now to wrap things up, I'd really like to thank you all for sitting through this presentation. I know it was long, but I hope you learned something. I had a great time studying this project this semester and I'm looking forward to learning more next semester. I'd like to leave you off with a few things. First, net zero building for multifamily apartment complexes is financially viable. It works with and without incentives as long as you're pricing to competitive market rates with the actual value of the services that you're providing. Second, it's technically feasible. And if they were able to do it in climate zone five, it's definitely possible in more forgiving climates. And third, please remember as you're making decisions to think about how they're going to impact future generations as our kids, our grandkids, and their grandkids all want to enjoy this awesome world in the same way that we did. Thank you so much. I'm Alex Romanowski. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. I'd be more than happy to connect and talk about this stuff. Take care.